Yeah. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. It's a choice. Don't sin, right? The Bible doesn't say you can't have a glass of wine with dinner. It says don't get drunk. That's a sin. And if you buzz in, you sin in. That's a drunk. In other words, both of them are okay. It comes down to convictions. The proposition from last week was a simple one. It said, keep your convictions, but don't make others stumble in your relationship with Christ while doing so, right? Keep your convictions. If you just want to eat vegetables, that's good. If you want to eat the meat supreme, you could do that too. If you want to have a glass of wine with dinner, go for it. And if you don't, that's okay. But don't condescend. Don't look down your nose at the other person that doesn't agree with what your, what your, what your opinion is because it comes down to a choice, a conviction, and we ended up saying that if any of these convictions ever cause somebody else to sin, don't do it. Period, like don't do it. If eating meat or eating vegetables or causing or, or drinking a glass of wine or not drinking causes your brother or sister to stumble, never do it again. It is not worth it. It's not worth it to express our religious freedom if we're gonna cause somebody else to stumble in their walk with Christ, amen? Because a lot of people, and I used to be one of them, would go around being very legalistic. You can't do this. You can't do that. And it's like, that's nowhere in the Bible, man. It was just me being overzealous for the Lord and wanting to give him my absolute best. But the good thing is that in this new attitude we have towards Christ, towards the weak and the strong, Christ always has a specific attitude towards us. So when it comes to um, anybody we could think of that would give us that example, it would always be Christ because he's somebody that put everybody else above himself. He's somebody to whom it didn't matter whether you ate meat or vegetables, whether you drank or didn't drink, that didn't matter. The only thing that he cared about was whether or not you would put your trust in him. The only thing that mattered to him was whether or not you would believe upon his name and trust him and him alone for your salvation. What better example do we have than that of Christ who foregoing his own comfort to safeguard that of his beloved willingly gave up his life on the cross. He was more concerned about pleasing his neighbors, those people that loved him. Amen? But let's jump into this text. We're going to be reading from Romans 15 verses 1 through 13. Romans 15, verses 1 through 13. So if you have your Bible, please stand up if you're able and join me for the reading of God's word. If you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen to your right. Romans 15, starting at verse 1. Let me get a solid amen when you were there. I'll wait to the rest of you, amen. Amen? And the word of God reads as follows, starting at Romans 15, 1. Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ has also accepted you to the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the fathers. And so that Gentiles may also glorify God for his mercy as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and I will sing praise to your name. Again it says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And then again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will appear. The one who rises to rule the Gentiles, the Gentiles will hope in him. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit. People of God, this is the word of God. Please be seated, family. Did you notice that it's a lot of the same stuff that we've been talking about for the last couple of months? 
Let me ask that again. Did you guys notice there's a lot of stuff that we've been talking about for the last couple of months? Right? A, a new attitude in Christ makes us act differently towards everyone. And now we've been given even further instructions to not just tolerate people, like don't just put up with them. We've been given further instructions to not just tolerate them, not just put up with the weaker one or the stronger one, but we've also been told that we have an obligation to build them up. It's not just about tolerating people. It's not just about putting up with them. We now have an obligation to build them up. How many people in the past have you just written off because of something dumb. You don't have to lift your hand up. I don't want you to put yourself on blast in front of everybody. But all of us have written people off in the past and it's usually been for stupid things, like something really insignificant or minor. And here the Apostle Paul is telling us that we have a strong obligation, the strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of the weaker and to build them up. So it's not just about not writing somebody off. It's not just about putting up with them. We have an obligation. An obligation is a very strong word. It's not a suggestion. It's not a, hey, yo, by the way, if you have chance, can you go ahead and disciple that one brother? Oh, hey, you, if you get done with this early, can you go out with that sister and, and take her for coffee? And like, no, we have an obligation to help build these people up. We need to encourage them. We need to help them succeed because if they succeed, guess who else succeeds? The kingdom succeeds, right? The kingdom succeeds. We need to be on each side of them and holding up their arms that they might win their battles like Moses. Do you guys know what story I'm talking about? If you don't, don't worry. I'm going to get into it in a few minutes. But today's proposition is going to be really easy to remember. This is my argument. We must follow Christ's example in accepting each other and build them up so that what? We can glorify God together. Instead of being worried about being weak or strong, meat, no meat, vegetables, alcohol, not, it doesn't matter. We need to follow Christ's example and accepting each other that we might build each other up and glorify God together. And there's three things I want to point out to you this afternoon. The first is this. We have an obligation not only to put up with each other, but to build each other up. The second is where do we get the strength from? The word of God gives us the strength to do this. And three, in case you don't know how to go about it, we must follow Christ's example in doing this, right? The first point, we have an obligation to not only put up with each other, but to build each other up. Again, obligation is a very strong word, right? Like you, there, there's no way of getting around it. You can't circumvent and say, yeah, we have an obligation. We must build each other up, we must. We need to be their cheerleaders. We need to be their Aaron and her. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. In the Old Testament, Israel was fighting against the Amalekites. And every time Moses had his hands up with the staff of God that had given him, they would win. And the moment his arms started getting tired and the staff would come down, guess what? They started losing. So Aaron and her came on each side of him. They put a rock underneath him to sit on and they held his hands up. For what? So that they can continue to win. We need to be the Aaron and her of these people to build them up. That when they get tired, they would be supported by us. They would be strengthened by us. And there wouldn't be any division because they eat meat or eat vegetables or drink or not drink. Like, that's irrelevant. If it's not a sin, it doesn't matter. And we shouldn't let it become an issue to cause them to stumble because then what? We're in sin. If we let a secondary issue become a, a, a primary issue, then you know what? We are in sin because we are causing them to stumble and we are disrupting their walk. Verse one says that now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for what? For his good and to build him up because even Christ did not please himself. Think about it. If you were Christ, would you have wanted to go up on the cross for a bunch of people that hated you? If you were Christ, would you willingly choose to go up to the cross and sacrifice for a bunch of people that can't stand you? If you were Christ, would you even consider giving everything up for a bunch of people that want to have nothing to do with you? But even Christ 
did not please himself. The word isn't telling us to abandon our convictions. It's not telling us to do sinful things in the name of building somebody up. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is don't let it become an issue. Don't let that stop you from helping to build somebody up. As a matter of fact, that shouldn't be an issue because we must. We have an obligation to support each other and to build each other up. For even Christ did not please himself, but instead died for those that believe in him. 1 Corinthians 10.33, the apostle Paul says the same thing in a different part of the New Testament. He says, just as I also try to please everyone and everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many so that they may also be saved. Amen? So that they may be saved. He's not telling people what they need to do. He's living it out. He's not saying, hey, this is what you should do. He is teaching what he's saying by living it out himself. The season that we're in right now, it's called what? Lent. We are in the season of Lent. And many Christians love it. They look forward to it and are excited about the process that they enter. One of repenting, of fasting, and praying before receiving the greatest gift ever, which is salvation. We look forward to Christ being raised from the grave. We look forward to Easter Sunday, seeing each other at church, and we usually say on Easter Sunday, Christ is risen, right? And what is the response? He is risen indeed. Like we look forward to saying those things. We look forward to being reminded how Christ is still alive. But then we would have some really strong, hardcore Christian brothers that say, that's paganism, you shouldn't be studying that. You shouldn't be celebrating that. No chocolate bunnies, no Easter eggs. Amen, brother, I agree with you. I agree with you. But we don't celebrate Easter bunnies or eggs or chocolate candies. We celebrate the risen Savior himself. Amen? It says that we have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves, but instead each one is to please his neighbor for his good and to build them up. Well, how can I do it, Pastor Rudy? I don't really know that much. Or how can I do it, Pastor Rudy? I don't really have patience. Sometimes I just don't like people. Well, let's go to what the second point says. Two, the word of God gives us the strength to do this. The word of God. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. I'm telling you right now, the word of God will give you the strength to do this. Verses four through six, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus. That's what, about, what it's about for us to live in harmony together. So that what? So that we may glorify God the Father of our Lord Christ with one mind and with one voice. There should be no division between us. We should be doing ministry together for the building up of the kingdom. The Bible tells us over and over, be strong and what else? Courageous. Be strong and be courageous. You see, we always need to look to the triune God for strength for encouragement, for faith, for wisdom, and especially to check us when we're falling away. The word of God should convict, and the word of God should also heal. And the word of God also instructs. We know that the word of God is truth, and God continues to speak through his truth, through his word. It's alive, and it's sharper than a what? A two-edged sword. Listen to what Hebrews 4.12 says. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and marrows and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The word of God, we don't just read the word of God, the word of God reads us. It says that it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's what the Bible does. We don't just read the Bible, the word of God also reads us. The word of God also heals us, and the word of God convicts us. Psalm 119.50 says, This is my comfort and my affliction, that your promises give me life. And where are his promises? Right here. Here are his promises. Here is the word of God, and this is what we need to know. Internalize in our heart that we may stand upon his word. And here specifically, Paul says in verse 4, that what was written in the Old Testament was to teach us, and that through these teachings we would have hope. That through these teachings we would have encouragement that comes from God's word. And why is that so important? Verse 5 tells us that it's important so that God, the source of said hope and encouragement, would grant us to live in harmony with one another. So whether you're weak or you're strong, 
whether you eat meat, veggies, drink, not, none of that stuff, it doesn't matter. We need to strive for harmony. Verse six says, so that we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. That's why. But the only way we'll be able to glorify God together with some of these differences is by the word of God himself. What does the Westminster Shorter Catechism tell us in question one? It says what? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is the chief end of man, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. He gives us the strength to do much more than that. You can't do it on your own. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. A lot of us need to be reminded, you can't do it on your own. Stop and wait for the Lord. Ephesians 6.10 tells us, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You getting the idea? Wait for the Lord. That's where our strength comes from. And if you have any doubts, John 15.5 says, the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Because without me, you can do what? Nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Think about that. We can't do anything without him. It kind of puts things into perspective, right? Without God, we can't do anything. And verse three, um, the third point, says that we must follow Christ's example in doing this. Verse seven says, therefore, accept one another just, just as Christ has also accepted you to the glory of God. In other words, the very same way that Jesus has accepted you with all of your faults, with all of your shortcomings, with all of your downfalls, we need to also accept each other. John 1, 2, 1, 12 tells us that to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He didn't just accept you. He died for you. For all those who believed in him, he gave up his life and he gave the right to become children of God. What was the last thing you done for him lately? What was the last thing you did for your brother or your sister lately to imitate what Christ had done for us? We have an obligation not just to put up with each other, but to build each other up and to follow Christ's example in doing so. Think about that for a second. How many disciples did Jesus have? Y'all are some horrible Christians. How many disciples did Jesus have? That's not a trick question, guys. Like, how many disciples did Jesus have? He had 12 disciples, right? 12 disciples. How many of them had went to seminary? How many of them even knew how to read? Think about it. When Christ chose his disciples, they hadn't been trained, they hadn't been educated, and they were living their best life now until Christ called them into ministry, and they stopped what they were doing to follow him. Would you say that they were spiritually strong at the time? No, right? They weren't strong, they were weak. Yet he devoted three years of his life, day and night, pouring into them every single day, not just teaching them, but demonstrating how to live it out. And they were some hard-headed individuals, right? Right? They were some hard, like, Peter was a fool, right? Like, are you serious, Peter? Peter was like the worst out of all of them. Peter talked too much when he should have been listening. He bragged about never leaving Jesus, but when, the, when, the, when it came down to it, he was the first one to throw in the towel. Three times he denied Christ. Three times, not once, three times. He was supposed to be Christ, ride or die. Yet he was the very first one to say, I don't know him. Not once, twice, but three times he denied Christ. Peter got violent and acted in a way contrary to what Jesus was teaching. He didn't trust Jesus when he was walking on water and began to what? He began to sink because he took his eyes off of Christ. And heck, how about Judas? Do you think Christ didn't know that Judas was going to betray him? Of course he knew. Yet he still treated him equal like everybody else. He still poured into him there was a purpose to what Judas was going to do. We must follow Christ. I think about how hard that must be just to sit there and look at somebody in the eye and know that he's gonna turn his back on you, yet still have to love them in the midst of it. To sit there and say, I know this dude wants the worst of me and he will do whatever he can to trip me up every step of the way, but I am still called to love him as Christ has loved me. 
I am still called to accept him as Christ has accepted me. I am still called to help build him up, even knowing what he's going to do. I'm glad I'm not Christ. We are to accept people where they're at. But I want to give a disclaimer that even though we are to follow Christ's example, when I say that we are to meet everybody where they're at, remember, some of these people may be in the midst of gross sin. I'm not telling anybody to compromise the word of God. I would never ask you to do that. Our aim is to help people learn the word of God, that the word of God would do its work and convict people and show them what sin is and we love them in the midst of that. Amen? It's not our job to beat somebody upside the head with the Bible. It's our job to show them what the Bible says and teach them what the word of God says and let the word of God do the work of the word of God. And in the midst of their sanctification, in the midst of their being renewed and regenerated and becoming somebody new in Christ, we love them. And we love them and we're patient for, with them, and we pray for them, and we encourage them. And when their hands get tired because they're struggling with something, we come up beside them and we lift up their hands. And we pray for them, and we continue to do it, because you know what? They will get ahead. If Christ is at the center of their lives, Christ will not leave them hanging. The Word of God says in Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work within you will complete it upon the day of Jesus Christ. That's not a maybe. That's a promise of God. God will not leave you hanging. Your homies may have left you hanging. Your ex may have left you hanging. Your job, your employer may have left you hanging. Your family members might have left you hanging, but God will not leave you hanging. I promise you. I promise you. I promise you. We are called to help each other. Don't condone their sin. Love on them in the midst of them being made new. Thomas Watson, an English Puritan, said it best. He said, until sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Until we know how bitter our sin is, Christ will never be sweet to us. It is our job to help people realize how much they need Christ by knowing how great their sin is. And we do it in love. We do it in love. So if we're to follow Christ's example and accept each other and to build them up to glorify God together, there's got to be an easy way of doing that, right? I wish there was a perfect, simplistic answer, but there's not. But let me give you three, three tips. The first is become a servant just as Christ did. Become a servant just as he did. And the second is to rejoice and praise the Lord in front of everybody and anybody. Don't be embarrassed to him. Because his word says that he will be embarrassed of you. And the third is to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill you with joy and peace that you might overflow with hope. Become a servant just as Christ did. Verse 8 tells us that for I say that Christ became a servant of the uncircumcised on behalf of God's truth. He became a servant of the Gentiles, the people that were, that were not of Israel, the people that he shouldn't have been getting along with, the ones that were considered his enemies. Christ became a servant to them as well. Think of those people who you may not get along with, the people that society says you should be at odds with. We are to follow Christ's example and to serve them as well. The second point is to rejoice and praise the Lord in front of everybody and anybody all the time. Verse 11, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. Praise God wherever you're at, in front of whoever you're with. Rejoice. Rejoice always. Rejoice when you're with the weaker brothers, with the stronger ones. Rejoice. And if you haven't been doing it, get to it. It's contagious. You ever been around somebody they call Debbie Downers, always walking around with a messed up face? Like, that's contagious. You walk around somebody who's walking in the spirit and that stuff, like, it's invigorating, right? Like, it just pumps you up to want to, like, why can't I feel what they're feeling? Because you're probably not reading your Bible. You're probably not going to church. You're probably not praying. You're probably not hanging around the people of God. Like, this stuff is contagious. Surround yourself with the people of God that you might also be walking in the spirit as they are. And the third is pray that the Holy Spirit would fill you with peace and that you might overflow with hope. Verse 13 says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Family, pray, seek, your, seek to draw closer to God that you might be filled with joy. I promise as you try to get close to God, he will draw you near. You will experience peace. You will experience joy. Even when everything around you is falling down, I promise you, you will experience peace. I promise you, you will experience peace. As you get closer to God, I'm not telling you that your life is going to get better. What I am telling you is that you will be able to experience peace where most people won't. 
where most people are frantic, clawing at the walls, wondering how something's going to change, their life's going to get better, you will experience peace because you will begin to trust what is in this book. And this book is the Word of God, and there are many promises in it. Get to know them and call God on them. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, your only Son, whom you sent into this world to die for us. Lord, your word tells us in Romans 5, 8 that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were still rebels against God, while we were still God's enemies, you sent your son to die on the cross and he willingly went. Father, help us learn from you that there would be no division amongst brothers and sisters for secondary and, and, and non-important issues, non-essential issues, Lord, and that we would be able to focus on you and your word and to serve you, Father that we could do so wholeheartedly. Father, I pray for every single person in here now who is experiencing some type of trouble, some extreme hardship that they would be comforted by your words, that they would find peace in your word, that your holy scriptures would be a salve to their soul to heal whatever wound they have there, Lord. And Father, I pray that whoever is comfortable in here now I pray whoever just kicking back and enjoying life and doing nothing for you, that you would afflict them and that you would cause them to be uncomfortable and to serve you and to worship you and to honor you and to know your word, Lord. And I pray for us now as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, knowing that you would be present spiritually here, Father, that it would be spiritual encouragement and nourishing for our bodies and our souls. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. And family, now we come to the end of our service where to me this is the cherry on top. To me this is the opportunity that we get to come and to experience Christ himself at the Lord's table. Why do we do this every single week? Because that's what God told us to do. On the night when Christ was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns again. He also gives us a stark warning and tells us that this isn't just for anybody. And this isn't just for you to come however you are. He gives us a warning. He says this, So then whoever eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person therefore examine himself in this way before. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So family, take a moment, if there's any unconfessed sin in your life, if there's any doubt, anything that you just need to say, Lord, please forgive me and prepare me that I may come and be spiritually nourished. Take a moment and do so now. Close your eyes, close your heart, and talk to God before we open up the table. Amen? Please take another moment. Holy Spirit, we thank you. As my brothers and sisters still have their heads down, their eyes closed, praying to you, asking you for forgiveness, I, I pray that anything that's in our hearts that needs to surface, Lord, that, that you would let that happen now, that we would confess that to you, that you would purify our hearts and our minds and remove any, any evil, any sin, any wickedness at this time, Lord, to, to prepare us to come before your table and to receive you. Bless us, forgive us, and thank you for this table. Amen. Family, as always, I want to remind you that um, we have a blue chalice which has wine in it. The white chalice has juice in it. Um, this is for anybody who has placed their faith in Christ. If that's not you, that's fine. We want you to know that we love you and that you're cared for. But this is for all those people who have placed their trust in Christ 
please come forward. We will, we will give you the bread. We'll say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. You will tear a piece off. We will extend the cup to you and say, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. You will dip it in the cup, say thanks be to God, and partake and go back to your seats. Amen? Family, the table of the Lord is served. Please come hungry. 